Welcome everybody for the for this new session of the student seminar. So this time is going to be the, <coughs> the time of uh, Christoph Tonis, that he is working in Antares, in the Antares group in the FIC, and he will talk about indirect search of dark matter with cosmic ray. Okay, so let's begin. Since I thought that it would probably be not very interesting for you to just talk about the technicalities of my search, I broadened it up a bit and I will talk about different indirect detection methods that, there are, that exist with a small handful of uh, examples and then I will in more detail explain what I've been doing and about the well, the two searches of dark matter that I'm involved, involved with, um, also showing you the results that are released and a bit of a comparison to what is to come in the future. So first, indirect detection principle. <coughs> so probably all of you have seen this sort of diagram here. When it comes to detecting dark matter, there are three ways to do this in a, in a more telling way, rather than just via some sort of gravitationally mediated phenomenon like uh, velocity distributions that you have in galaxies. One would be to directly produce dark matter particles in an accelerator, which would be taking this diagram upwards, taking this diagram to the right, or also to the left would be scattering of dark matter with standard model particles, which is what one looks for in direct detection experiments. Indirect detection is the annihilation of WIMPs into standard model particles, uh, typically in celestial objects somewhere out in space in uh, active collective nuclei in the Milky Way in the Sun, where you expect dark matter to accumulate. And uh, typically the annihilation of WIMPs is uh, assumed as uh, the signal that, that you look for. Alternatively, you can also have very slowly decaying dark matter with a very, very, very long lifetime. There are also searches for this or other more exotic models, like uh, if you want to look into this uh, secluded dark matter, which is interesting, which would be decay of a WIMP in a mediator particle in a secluding field that then decays into uh, standard model particles. So when you take the indirect detection <coughs> approach, there are three types of particles you can look for. Charged standard model particles, protons, antiprotons, electrons, positrons. You can take photons specifically in the gamma ray range. This is uh, rather interesting. And you can take neutrinos, which is what I'm doing. And this picture here in the background already shows a bit about what the advantages and the downsides are. So first about the charged standard model particles. They're easily detectable. You do not need a huge experiment to detect charged standard model particles, so you can build them small enough to fit in a satellite. But you can also build uh, bigger detectors like the upcoming project CTA, which uh, would be able to see charged particles producing showers. Um, the big downside to those types of searches is that you do not know where the uh, charged particles come from since they change the direction according to how magnetic fields influence them. So you can only make some sort of a diffuse flux analysis looking for some feature in this diffuse flux that might come from dark matter annihilations. One example would be Pamela which I show here, which is just a basic detector consisting of layers of uh, ionization detectors that basically can see a, a track of a particle and on the bottom you have a calorimeter that then measures in uh, the, the energy of the particles that Pamela detects and Pamela looks for all sorts of charged particles. In the sky it's uh, a satellite mission in this Rhesus DK1 satellite so as I looked this up, this was a commercial satellite that was sent up by some company. And while it is rather high altitude, uh, 570 kilometers at uh, 70 degrees inclination, 
This was originally a oblong kind of orbit that varied somewhere in between 350 and 670 kilometers. But the orbit has later been changed. And this whole project has been going on since 2006, uh, since this change in orbit occurred in 2011, 2012, around that time. And while well, they have had some discovery of some feature that people attributed to dark matter, but the problem is that, as you see here, um, <coughs> this is a feature of a diffuse flux. You can pin it to an object, and it's also a problem that these kinds of searches not necessarily need to point towards dark matter. So basically it's fair to say they have seen something which could be dark matter, it could also be something else. This is equally a problem with photons. You can similarly easily detect gamma rays, even at higher energies, though this gets a bit more difficult than high energy charged particles. And again, you can have big terrestrial detectors, you can have detectors in satellites, and the problem is that there are certain astrophysical uncertainties amongst the propagation, and of course, a, any feature that you detect could be a variety of effects. So we already know of very, very many features that uh, show up in this in gamma radiation spectra, spectra, and if you see any new feature, this could be all sorts of things. So it's difficult to pin any form of discovery down to to dark matter, even something like what uh, Dharma Libra has been seeing. So their annual modulation that could be have a number of causes, which is also one of the reasons why this is not really so much accepted as evidence for dark matter that they really have seen dark matter. It's seen they have seen something. It's difficult to pin anything to dark matter. Two examples that are currently operate <coughs> in operation would be Hess and Fermi. I don't know, I've, I've, I, I've heard of Hess as well as studying from my master because we had some people from Hess at our university. I think here in Valencia is nobody from Hess involved. And I've heard just a lot of people that haven't heard about Hess, surprisingly, even in, in astrophysics. Maybe I just talked to the wrong people and it has something to do with me being in neutrinos. And of course the Fermi Large Area Telescope. So first Hess, this is how the, these telescopes look like. I think this is the big telescope that they have in Hess. It consists of four small with a 12 meter dish and one large telescope with a 28 meter dish. And they are located in Namibia in a place that if I just had that word, I would think it's in Germany, Gamsberg. It's probably a German guy that named that, that mountain. And the small telescopes have close to 400 of these, uh, these, these individual mirror dishes that reflect the radiation that comes into the dish onto a camera. The big one has twice or more than twice the number of mirror dishes. They are made from aluminized uh, glass, so this is pretty much a normal mirror, maybe made with a bit more sophisticated method to have better reflectability. And the cameras they use consist of many, many photomultipliers. So something like uh, a bit more than two PMTs per dish, you could say. So uh, 960 for the small. For the for small 2,048 PMTs for the large telescope, and they started installing the small telescopes in 2002. Some years later, two years later, they were finished with the whole setup. The big telescope was set up in 2012, and they are since then taking data. And uh, this has magic is a similar project. There are several projects like this that use some different technical methods to detect all of this. And I tried to put an animation here, but after at the end I failed, so I just put a single image of this. This is how a shower looks like in this detector, so this is an image of how the pixels look like. You can really see how such a shower w that, that then uh, plays itself out in the atmosphere appears in this detector. Typically, they take in has uh, a coincidence method, so they say we do not take just single camera images. We only say we have an event when they have in at least three of the telescopes such an image like this. 
I couldn't find a picture for that, but I have seen this in other presentations. If they have a muon, they can also see Cherenkov uh, light, and they can really clearly identify the, the muons because the Cherenkov light makes a circle in the camera that is extremely characteristic for these muons. <coughs> so then there's Fermilat. Everybody heard of this, and it puts really stringent limits for dark matter on uh, I think at the moment it's still the the most stringent amongst all the indirect detection experiments so the satellite it's it's on a satellite mission near uh, the near earth orbit it started in 2008 um, this energy ranges for really really high energetic astrophysics well as it's of some interest but there are many Th th there are ranges of energy above this, so you have PEV astrophysics with several detectors that are going on, specifically CTA will also look at very much higher energies. But this energy range is really interesting for dark matter searches since the vast majority of models that you have, specifically supersymmetric models, would produce um, particle fluxes in that energy range. This is similar for 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 neutrinos, though I think photons on average get a bit more energy than neutrinos. And, well, they have some sort of an, uh, a anti coincidence detector. I think this is a scintillator that tries to veto out background events. Um, and, well, I think this is a bit redundant. I have this image here, which shows how the detector works. So they typically look for pair production in this detector. They essentially track electron and positron with these uh, with ionization detectors so you have these uh, silicon s silicon str strap detectors are they're called and they basically look for ionization tracks and in the end you have a calorimeter that measures the energy of it which is how Fermilat does its measurements <coughs> now to neutrinos the big downside to neutrinos is you have a very hard time finding any neutrinos so a small experiment is not going to do this you cannot really make effectively or at this point not really build a satellite mission that detects neutrinos so everything that you do has to be earthbound and you have to have really big detectors um, kilometer cubic kilometer detector volume is typically what you get before you have a decent effective area to detect any neutrinos and <coughs> the upside is that neutrinos d are not subjected to as many astrophysical uncertainties so with photons there's some properties of the propagation the only thing that really occurs with neutrinos are neutrino oscillations and they are fairly well understood they average out statistically specifically if you have larger sources you have some kind of one to one to one or one to one ratio for electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos and you understand that very well and there are some smaller additional effects but in the end it on large distances averages out so you do not have as many astrophysical uncertainties and in some cases also the neutrino production within the source and the, the background is better understood like for example solar neutrinos we know the fusion process to a rather well degree from uh, gamma radiation and from from photons that come from there so <coughs> you can sometimes model the background a bit better, specifically since that doesn't happen so much to neutrinos. So it's reasonable to say, even on the in within the source, there are not that many effects uh, or that, that affect the, the neutrino flux. As two examples that I put here, I will have Antares and IceCube. I wanted to maybe talk a bit about CAME3Net, but CAME3Net isn't fully constructed at the moment, so restrict myself to the two projects that are already running. Yeah, this. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, there were satellite missions that basically that look down on the atmosphere and see those showers. They have certain limitations. Yeah, that's true. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, for the neutrino detectors that currently produce something, it's all Earth-bound. Sure. So, yeah, at the moment, there in the future, there will be something like that, yeah. That's true. But okay, here, um, indirect detection of dark matter with neutrino telescopes in specific. Of course, there are this, these other detectors that uh, will be constructed in the future. Typically, you have WIMP accumulations in massive celestial objects, most notably the Milky Way, where which is the most promising source, which uh, produces the, the lowest sensitivities and limits for all these experiments. You have WIMP accumulations there. They annihilate and produce neutrinos that pass through the Earth most of the time and then produce a muon somewhere near the detector. And then, for example, Antares can detect this. And the typical annihilations, they can lead to all sorts of standard model particles. Um, later on, I will introduce some uh, further problems that, that come with that it's not entirely known in what, which particles will how frequently be produced in the annihilation primarily. Um, that at the moment, this is that. So what then happens with the how the detection then works is basically you have a neutrino, it passes by the detector, produces in typically in the vicinity of a nucleus, an interaction, typically an exchange of a W boson with the nucleus. A muon comes out of this, travels through the detector, produces Cherenkov light that has this typical 43 degree cone angle. So since they are the muons are very highly relativistic, there's not a much of a variation in the velocity as perceived from uh, the the detector system. So the cones are typically having around the same opening angle or very similar opening angles as they move through the detector. So then you have photons that are omitted in this kind of cone shape. In HES this produces rings on the camera. In IceCube we really can then in, in, in a 3D manner resolve to a certain degree this cone and then these cones are then reconstructed which then is of course a larger effort of finding of triggering with some coincidence methods when do we have a cone and also it's difficult uh, to reconstruct them specifically a problem is if we have atmospheric muons like those here so you have a cosmic ray it produces a shower and we have a muon that passes through sometimes we have muons that are downgoing in the detector and we reconstruct them as upgoing which is problematic for us since the main way how neutrino telescopes reject the background is to make a horizon cut. You basically use the Earth as a shield against everything that might be a, a background in the form of atmospheric muons, which are the most crucial one. The typical, the dominant, the dominant source of background that you have is in this area here, atmospheric muons that are misreconstructed. And as you can see here, atmospheric neutrinos, so basically you have cosmic rays that hit the atmosphere, produce a neutrino, this neutrino passes the Earth and then produces an event in the detector. So this is something that with the Earth we cannot blend out and the dominant source at uh, below the horizon of what we have as a background. As you can see here in a comparison in between data and uh, Monte Carlo. So we have here in red the atmospheric muons dominating above the horizon. Below the horizon it's the blue curve that is dominating the picture which are atmospheric neutrinos. Okay, now some details about Antares. So we are one and a half kilometer below the sea, the sea, so Antares is installed to the seabed with these uh, anchors. We are 40 kilometers offshore and the, the station is in a small village called La Seine-sur-Mer, which is in the area of Toulon in southern France. Antares has 12 lines of about half a kilometer length, total of 25 stories, which means we have 60, 75 meters, uh, or 60, 75 uh, meters, one of the stories. Each has three optical modules with one PMT inside, as you can see here in this picture. And on the, on the sea floor, you have a typical s uh, uh, spatial separation of 14.5 meters in between them. They are in, arranged in some sort of a, of a grid with very regular spacing between the uh, different detector, the individual detector lines. 
We have a total of 900 PMTs with 300 chronometers in all these individual modules, which I mentioned particularly because it's my job in the collaboration also to do the time calibration, which is a great pain, as you can imagine, synchronizing 300 clocks with some, um, with, for once we have two lasers of which just one works at the moment that shoot up laser beams for the, the time calibration and we have every five stories also optical beacons that produce with with uh, with <coughs> LEDs flashes of light that we use for time calibration. The first line was installed in uh, 2007, I think in spring it was. Well, I wasn't in, in Antares at this as the seventh. So I was getting my every two in Germany at that year, and the last line was installed in 2010 in summer so we um, it's it's uh, since 2007 that we have been taking data and 2007 was well not the full detector configuration that was installed at that po uh, moment then there's ice cube and well ice cube is at installed in the south pole and is a lot bigger than Antares so they are installed uh, 1.4 kilometers below the ice near the geographical South Pole and they have 86 lines typically the the limits that they produce is ice cube uh, 79 limits because they use 79 active limits of the main ice cube detector part of the detector is part of uh, it's a, a fraction of the detector is part of what they call deep core which is a region in the center of ice cube where they have put six additional lines with their modules in order to reach lower neutrino energies and to have have a better sensitivity for low energy neutrinos which is particularly important for dark matter because the dark matter neutrinos will be in comparison to the very high energetic neutrinos that ice cube has detected very very low energetic in comparison so most of the sensitivities and limits are dominated but what they get with with deep core they have uh, a total uh, you have detector lines of one kilometer length and a ground area of uh, a square kilometer which then leads to roughly a kilometer cube detector volume with 5160 sensors so it's a big project with a lot more mod individual modules than Antares but also the modules have more spacing which means that uh, in this case, since if, if you have detector modules in, an, in a neutrino telescope that have more spacing, there are a lot of events that just cannot produce enough light to hit more than one line of the detector. When you only have events on one hits on one line, the reconstruction of the event does not give you which uh, phi direction the event that came from. You ju basically just have an elevation of the of the event. In Ice Cube, they only use multi-line events. In Antares, we have a way to reconstruct them, but you have a lot of background since it's much more likely to coincidentally trigger something that isn't really a, a neutrino. And you also <coughs> very often run into the problem of misreconstructing the elevation of such a single line event, so we have more background. Back to Ice Cube. Here's just a visualization of how this looks like with ice with deep core here in the middle. The reason why this part here is left out is a dust layer that they have that at the moment that they installed IceCube they didn't know so IceCube has a big or mostly transparent uh, dust layer in the ice that gives them some trouble so sometimes they have to adjust this with how they put V2 regions and such to take care that there's just one one, air, uh, one entire layer in IceCube where they have difficulty with the light propagation due to all the dust that is in the ice. Then, why to have two projects? Here's a comparison between the visibility of the, the sky, so which types of sources are visible. So here you can see the visibility of Ice Cube. If you sit on the geographical South Pole, you only see the Northern Hemisphere with your neutrino telescope. The Northern Hemisphere is almost invisible. Most notably, they cannot directly look at the galactic center. They can only make a halo analysis looking for the outskirts of the galactic halo. Uh, or they can use a veto where they use the outer part of the detector as a vetoing machine, reducing therefore the volume, effective volume of the detector. 
and also cutting out all sorts of neutrinos that get converted into a uh, the neutrinos that produce a, a muon outside of the detector that then reaches into the detector. Those events they also have to cut out. This is then called the muon range and this gives IceQ quite a lot of problems that Antares doesn't have. We can directly see for quite a significant fraction of time the galactic center and therefore produce limits and sensitivities for this. This is important because later on you will see we can actually compete with IceCube, which has something to do with this visibility, considering that we're looking directly at a source that IceCube cannot directly see. Then some general things about model uncertainties that all these indirect detection experiments have, so particularly photons and neutrino, uh, neutrino experiments. First of all, there's the J factor. This is basically the, the way that the halo model that you consider influences the limits that you calculate. So from the get-go, you look at the source and you have a certain spectrum that uh, the, the, the neutrinos or the photons have that you expect, and then you put a limit on this flux. But you want to convert this into a model parameter, like, for example, uh, annihilation cross-section, this sigma v, which is a thermally averaged annihilation cross-section. And you can convert a flux, d phi de, with this j factor, and some. these are some halo parameters, scaling radius of the uh, dark matter halo, scaling density, and the wind mass down here. So you take some parameters from, from the, the, the halo plus this j factor, which is basically the squared dark matter density integrated alongside a, a line of sight. And here it appears also integrated over a d omega. So you take this j of theta and you integrate this over d omega for an observation window that you put for yourself. In the case of Ice Cube and Antares, we have chosen a, 15 d, uh, a 30 degree opening angle for this uh, observation window. And this, this J factor, depending on what halo model you use, can greatly vary. So in between IceCube and Antares, we have tried to converge this, but at the moment there's still a factor of 1.9, something around that area, in between the, the J factor that we have and that IceCube uses, which skews the limits they produce a bit in their favor. So this is always some, some assumptions that then influence what kind of limits you put. And ultimately, we don't really know what is the correct halo model. One can make an educated guess and try to figure this out based on other clust uh, galaxy clusters or other galaxies that we observe. But it's ultimately just a matter of fitting and there are different models that you can use. Another, th this is um, a plot from a program package called Clumpy, where you can see um, the, that we in Antares use for calculating this J factor. So you can see that also this is 10 degrees, so until 10 degrees you still have quite a considerable increase of the overall J factor, which also tells you, this is the example of the center of the Milky Way, that the galactic center in terms of dark matter cannot be considered a point source, but has to be treated as extended, which particularly <coughs> in, in, in some searches really does make a difference. Um, then there's the dark matter neutrino signal that has to be simulated and for the Earth and the Sun, for the Antares analysis, we use the WIMSIM package, which is kind of a standard that is used in many collaborations. Um, there's also Marco Cirelli, who has his poor physicist's cookbook, who uh, at the moment he has on, on the web page the spectra for the galactic center for annihilations in vacuum that are used and they are basically calculations of uh, that just happen in the standard model. You basically make an assumption that you have only annihilations in a benchmark channel where in Antares and IceCube we use five channels for the galactic center and for all sorts of sources which is the BB bar, tau plus tau minus, W plus W minus, one where the particle produces uh, annihilation produces muons and one for muon neutrinos. So they are used as benchmark. Most comparisons show a tau channel for the comparison. In case of the sun, the muon and the neutrino channel are ignored, mainly because muons in the sun, for example, get reabsorbed very fast. 
So we do not have that much, or we, we do not expect that considerable fluxes from these channels so much. Um, this is an example for, I think this is one TEV, uh, one TEV WIMP that uh, here for, for the different <coughs> channels that you have. <coughs> so basically as soon as you fix the WIMP mass and you say all the annihilations lead always to this type of, of particles, you can then just using standard model physics calculate what is the flux that you see at the earth also taking into account neutrino oscillations and all sorts of effects that you expect and you can see here that particular uh, I think the colors are better to recognize the BB bar channel is uh, leans most towards uh, low neutrino energies which is problematic we typically have better effective areas for high energy neutrinos than for low energy neutrinos so the BB bar channel always gives the, gives the worst um, result. The neutrino channel, which is here in black, has this resonance here, where we have kind of a re resonance in the annihilation production. And this, this leads to a la rather large number of neutrinos at high energies that you can then detect at the position of the, of the Earth, which then makes this the easiest to de the channel that is easiest to detect. And the truth uh, about a real, a realistic uh, model for particle dark matter lies somewhere in between. You have contributions from all channels, so the the spectra will be a kind of a linear combinations of all of them, depending on what branching ratios you have in the initial annihilation. Christa, yeah. That plot, uh, is considered also this electroweak band star? In the sense that maybe neutrinos are so energetic that can emit a I'm not sure about the specific plot. The latest spectra that we use have it. This is something that Marco Cirelli later on implemented. Mm -hmm. I think that in case of the Sun, this is not implemented in Wimsim thus far. But it, at some point it has been implemented by Marco Cirelli. The, uh, I would have to to look how old that that plot was if that was still the late the an earlier version. But the current galactic center results that we have take that into account. Now, to the results for the galactic center, I will also display on one plot the from the other experiments where they lie and how the different indirect detection methods perform in comparison. So first the uh, results that we have currently released use a analysis method that just makes a cone cut around the source, counts the event, and then uses the Feldman Cousins method to produce a limit just from the background estimate that you have within that cone or the amount of background in the case that you produce limits. And here is for we use two strategies A fit for high energies, BB fit, which is better for low energies. Maybe fit also being the strategy that can reconstruct single line events where we have a lot for the lowest energies. And here you can see how the cone cut behaves with with the, the energy. So the cone cut is basically optimized. We calculate the sensitivities for all cone cuts that we have between zero degree and twenty degrees on the reasonable range where we expect this 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 to end. And then just the the best model rejection factor, so the best sensitivities then chosen for the sensitivity and this uh, cut is then supposed to be representative of the angular resolution. It's proportional to the angular resolution. It's actually a bit bigger. We have something a bit less than one degree angular resolution for these highest energies and we have a one degree uh, cone cut for the highest energies with, with AFIT, with BBFIT, the angular resolution is a bit worse, like 1.3 degree for the highest energies, where we, oh, uh, 1.0, or a bit more than 1.0 degrees, and you see that there's more, there's this uh, higher cone cut than angular resolution, and you can also see that the worse the energy is, the fewer hits we have, the more difficult it is to fit with a good accuracy. So the angular resolution here is terrible for the lowest wind masses, for the lowest neutrino energies then as a result. In BBFIT, well BBFIT can sustain a reasonable an uh, angular resolution. This is just multi-line multi events. Single line behaves 
different and has an overall angular resolution of somewhere around 7 to 10 degrees depending on the energy of the neutrino that you, uh, that you use. Then unblinding has been done for this, so basically there are limits for this method. And this is a comparison in between the blue line, which is a background estimate that was used to produce the sensitivities, and the black crosses here, the, the black dots with the arrow bars, this is uh, the data. And there is no visible excess anywhere. There are some fluctuations, but no significant excess. And for that analysis, the data until 2012 has been used. Um, for the next galactic center analysis, uh, it is intended to also use 2013 data. And the total lifetime that we have is 1,321 days since, well, there are always times where you have to do calibrations. And there are always, there was once a story where we had a lizard in our electronics that shut down the detector for a good month. So accidents can happen and therefore this isn't just the, the number of days in this period. Um, this is how a effective area typically looks like. I display this because the effective area is most dominant in shaping and forming the flux limits and also the, the sigma v limits that we have since the limits and number of events typically stay constant over the wind mass more or less or stay rather stable and it's mainly the effective area that varies then. You can see that for the lowest wind mass we have very low energetic neutrinos and we get very bad effective areas so we typically perform the best at high wind masses, in the sigma v limit, you have also the wind mass squared as an influence there, which will then raise the sigma v limits for high wind masses. But in the flux limits, it basically behaves proportional to the effective area. So, so these, these effective masses are kind of uh, effective areas. Effective areas is like a, a, effective a convolution of the effect efficiency times the spectrum. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's technically called acceptance. The effective area is just how large is the detector for an incoming neutrino, and this is convolved with the spectrum, which is a science, f uh, w w which is a difficult process in itself. We have to treat neutrinos and antineutrinos independently, since the flux from dark matter annihilations is asymmetric in between neutrinos and antineutrinos. Though the effective area then is for neutrinos, antineutrinos pretty much equal. We have to separate that a bit because the fluxes are a bit different. This is then how the flux limits look like. Um, here oh, we have a combination of AFIT, which are the, is the solid line, uh, BBFIT is dot dashed and BBFIT single, uh, uh, dashed is BBFIT, dot dashed is BBFIT single line. This is difficult to see here. Uh, no, but these these are the li the limits that we have, and we we basically for each wind mass we choose the strategy that gives or well we choose within the sensitivities which strategy gives with which quality cut with which cold cut the best sensitivities, and with those cuts we then calculate the limits. So it's basically what you get if you only take the lowest points here of the limits. That is what what gives you the the combined limit that we have. Um, and you can see here the BBFIT single line things are that what takes over um, at, at wind mass below 100 GeV. For BB bar, BB bar leans more towards low, wind, uh, low, low neutrino energy, so there this crossing point is a bit earlier. And this crossing point corresponds to what you see here in the flux limit, so there they are at the same positions. I should have looked up how good you can see this in the, on a beamer. But anyway, this is then a comparison of how good we look in comparison to Ice Cube, in comparison to other experiments. So what you see here, Fermi at the moment is specific for low wind masses the best. Then there's Magic, a project similar to uh, to Hess that lies here. I think there's also a recent, a more recent Hess publication with a new limit that I did not have the time to put here. Should be also around this, maybe even lower. The only thing concerning Hess that, that I've put here is this 
inner circle here is where when you take the Pamela discovery together with HES, together with, with Fermi data, which would be the most favorable area for, for dark matter to li uh, lie within. But then again, Pamela sees a diffuse flux feature that can come from all sorts of things. And also if uh, Fermi or HES sees something that might not necessarily be dark matter. So this is just a hypothetical area that is put here. This red line here is all limit from Antares. This line here that is supposed to be blue, I don't know whether how good this is visible, is the most recent ice cube uh, limit that is put with uh, a dip at low wind mass, which comes from an under fluctuation that the ice cube has seen. We also have some fluctuations, but not at that low wind masses for our bin method. And again, if you take this comparison here, we can compete with the way that it's, it is displayed here. And on top of that, we have this factor of 1.9 because of the different model assumption for the halo. So we are, though being a much smaller experiment due to the location where we are and some, some things that IceCube has to, to take account for, still, we still can compete with IceCube, which is pretty amazing considering we have only 12 lines of, uh, of uh, photomultipliers. The other lines are uh, this one line for Antares, which is the highest line, which is with uh, dwarf galaxies. This is so high because we do not see, I think the, the best one is uh, Segue and Coma, which we don't, Coma we don't see that well with, uh, with Antares, which is why this blue line here for the deep blue line here for ice cube for dwarf galaxies is better than what we have. But yeah, this is just a bigger comparison of the different limits, specifically with neutrino telescopes, but also a comparison on how fo uh, the, the photon experiments, the, the uh, gamma ray astronomy looks in comparison. Then there's a unbind method, which is exactly what I do. And instead of just making or defining a cone around the source and count events, um, I produce uh, pseudo experiments according to background expectations that we have. So I, I make a random sky that is supposed to statistically behave exactly like we would expect a, a background to behave. And then I insert different numbers of signal into this according to the spectra that we expect according to what the, the, the angular resolution of our detector is. And those random skies or pseudo experiments are then uh, th th these are they are produced f mostly from Monte Carlo simulations and background expectations. In my case, I produce them from time scrambled data. And they are then run through a likelihood function that gives us a parameter ns, which is kind of a supposed number of signal events that the likelihood function sees in it. And what we do is we evaluate for different values of ns the, uh, the likelihood function look what gives the best result and then have a, a value of ns that gives us the most likely number of signal events in a certain event distribution, which doesn't work perfect. Sometimes background is misfortaken for signal, signal is misfortaken for background. So you have to take the statistical fluctuations into account. So you run many pseudo experiments, you analyze them, you give the the maximum likelihood, and then you define a parameter which is called the test statistics, which is basically the ratio in between um, the optimum likelihood for an optimized NS and uh, the NAA likelihood function for NS equals zero. Uh, typically, you take the logarithm of it. This is then to, to mitigate a bit of background fluctuations that might occur that might bias you, or that might give you problems that pr would require even larger amounts of statistics. And you basically look at the, the overlap in between the distributions of these TS values for different numbers of inserted signal events. And as soon as 90% of your TS distribution for certain number of sig inserted signal events is above the median of the of background only case, so the distribution of TS values for o where you do not insert any signal, then you say, okay, this is all sensitivity. 
in case that you produce a, uh, a limit, you just look what the actual data look like, what TS value you have for the actual data, and use this instead of the median to then construct the the limit from this with, uh, with 90 percent of the TS distribution is above the actual value that's then the limit or the, the number of single events that you have in it is then the limit. This is then a comparison you just put fl uh, for the flux in between uh, in between the the old bin search and the new unbit search this is a oh, this is half a year old I had to more more worry about the sun analysis. So you see a an improvement here in this case for low wind masses. Also here for low wind masses this comparison doesn't hold up so much. Specifically with low wind masses you run a bit out of statistics for producing for example the point spread function of your detector which you need for simulating signal events which you need for your likelihood function and overall the whole mechanism the whole analysis method only gives really a, or it doesn't give as much of an improvement for low wimp energies as for high wimp energies. So this is how this looks. This is only a comparison in between sensitivities. This is not comparison with the limits, so don't be confused that this looks different than this here. These are limits. These were sensitivities because yeah, if I would compare to limits, I would also compare to statistical fluctuations in the actual data. So for comparing the methods, that's not that a great approach. Then we ha also have a search towards the sun. For the sun we do not have a J factor that we assume, we just say that we have an equilibrium in between uh, accumulation of WIMS in the sun due to scattering and the annihilation within the sun. So we basically just calculate this conversion from flux to model parameters which is spin dependent and spin independent scattering cross sections by making this assumption that capture rate and annihilation rate is proportional to each other with a factor of one and a half because if you have one annihilation you lose two wimps if you have one scattering you gain one wimp and this is from the unblinding uh, this is a BB fit example for the unblinding of the bin method for the sun and you again see no access whatsoever this is one example plot for the spectra where you can see we only have put three channels here since the other one I'm expected not to give as much flux. Again BB bar being the most difficult to detect and this one they calculated with WIMSIM instead of taking from Michael Chirelli's web page. And this is then how the whole thing looks in case of the sun in comparison with, with ice tube in this case for the spin dependent uh, there's also the spin independent scattering cross section which looks different. Spin, de spin independent scattering cross section is mostly uh, the scattering cross section with helium, not with hy hydrogen. Since there's more hydrogen in the sun, the spin dependent part where you have mostly contributions from the pros from the from the hy hydrogen give the lower uh, the, the, the the lower limits, which is basically the point where if, if we look into the sun. For the spin independent part, we are much worse than direct detection in indirect uh, than direct detection. In case of the spin dependent part, we're actually better than direct detection, or we, we can compete with them. Let's say that. Um, here also a comparison between Ice Cube, but those are not as the, the uh, those are the older results. They're still the newest that they have published thus far, as far as I know. But um, they are <coughs> they're still somewhat older, so if they wouldn't use all the data that they have now, they could possibly beat us at this. Since the, for the visibility of the sun, there's not this big difference for ice cube. They can directly look at the sun with their detector. Here's then the comparison to the unbin method. One case for the uh, this uh, spin dependent, this is spin independent. You see again some improvement over the wind method, which breaks down at low wind masses. I try to do the unblinding, which I'm currently doing before this seminar, but I could not finish. We finished with this due to some shortages at the calculation center that we use, so they are doing something there. So, yeah, that's the final results that I had to show.
Now just the summary. So the indirect detection is quite interesting specifically for uh, as, as a complementary method to uh, the direct detection. We have some sometimes problems to uh, attribute what we see to dark matter directly specifically for, for photos. This is difficult task to do, but <coughs> we can we can still in some cases compete even with with uh, with uh, direct detection in case for the sun for the spin dependent part. Um, we can also constrain supersymmetry dark matter models even if we use neutrinos. Fermi Lat could do this well, for quite a while, but also now the research with neutrinos can cut into the uh, into a reasonable amount of proposed dark matter particle models. Um, <coughs> well, we can also compete with other uh, dark matter indirect detection methods that these had high wind masses, as you could see before, and and this is a bit surprising at least every time I bring this up at a conference, Antares can compete, specifically in the case of the Galactic Center, with Ice Cube, mainly because of this visibility, which I've been told I should advertise more. We've been a bit ignored lately <coughs> <laughs> in, uh, in Antares in uh, some publications. Ice Cube in their la latest publication has not uh, included our results, for example, which probably they will change after we've talked to them. Okay, questions? Anything? Well, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. on, on the discussion on, uh, on, the, on the limits of, from the sun, usually it's over. You, you mentioned several times that, uh, for example, any relationship with muons, uh, you don't give uh, mm. a flux at uh, high energies. Uh, and usually this is, that is true, that you have a flux at low energies mm. from muon decays. That also happens when, no. when annihilation goes to, to light works. You mm. don't have a uh, high energy neutrino flux, but you have a low energy yeah. neutrino flux that you can can use, uh, for example, mm. super yeah. Uh, yeah. That is usually overlooked. But yeah. Um, a, a colleague of, of mine from France, Vincent Bartin, was pointing out the same. The problem is I only have WIMSIM to calculate this, and WIMSIM is, does not take into account all the effects that they have, so Marco Cirelli has the better code. He has also for the muons and the neutrinos, or he has had this at some point in the past. He has taken this no, for he some he reason. Has, uh, computed that after yeah. We wrote that paper. Yeah. So it, it was us uh, who, who, did uh, that who Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He has calculated this. Um, we have been in communication with Marco Cirelli. He had the older version on his page. I think he has taken down the latest version that he has to calculate this anew or something like that. I, I don't exactly know the communication. We have somebody that uses his code to calculate these two cases for us. It's just that we are a bit under time pressure to release you this. Can, you can ask, uh, ask us because uh, I mean it was uh, me and uh, Nicolas and uh, you have your four neutrinos. The calculation. You do you do have uh, the, the spectra for neutrinos. Okay. <laughs> well, it's still I, I have to talk with with my I mean with Juan Ho and others. Uh, Martin Chile and collaborators did that paper. Uh. Okay. So okay. We explained them. Why actually? I explained them then how to how to compute. Okay. I will I will take in this into communi or communicate this with other people from the collaboration whether we should maybe delay the analysis a bit so that we can include that. But. but uh, I mean. Yeah, it's. But still, the neutrino. I, I think it's a bit optimistic to ourselves to assume that we produce. For, 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 for Andares, it's not We have a threshold of 25 GeV. This is MeV. MeV. Okay, yeah. No, this is this for Andares is not. Uh, it's not uh, interesting. Really yeah. Okay. Okay. By what I, what I, my point was that usually when discussing this type of limits, this uh, this neutrinos uh, are overlooked and not yeah. even mentioned. And uh, okay. I mean the limits. Not only they are they are competitive, but uh, at low masses. Mm. But also, uh, they are the only one, ex the only existing ones for those channels because mm. you don't have limits for high energy neutrinos or annihilation to neutrons or light like works. Mm. So uh. The point was just uh, okay, just to, to look that, that yeah. those channels which are present. Yeah. And for many years in the literature, 
it was, was it not? Mention, this don't give anything. So you were basically doing the same that it was about the sun, but promoting your own work. Or well, <laughs> I think it's, it's, not, it's really yeah. pushing for uh, yeah, clarification. These this, this things yeah. uh, should be used. I mean, um, okay. Yeah, but uh, as I said, we can in that house probably not do this because of our energy threshold. Okay. There are more questions. I have a main question. Why uh, electron neutrinos are not considered? I just said why electron is not good for antarctic. The electron? Yeah, they are too noisy for the. Or they they uh. don't absorb too fast and they cannot produce any kind of signal. Because a Cherenkov light is not going to because it's not like humans. Uh, that, oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> the thing is, for for once, if we if we look at muons that are produced, we have the flavor conservation that forces more neutrinos to produce. Reproduce. I don't know how much uh, oscillation you have from the typically electron neutrinos that they produce into more neutrinos. If you look in the sun, mm -hmm. so in the sun, it might be that we say, okay, the neutrino. Uh, don't maybe not enough uh, have have time to fluctuate into yeah no but I'm thinking like, mind that dark matter annihilates and <laughs> just uh, electron neutrino and electron neutrino or muons mm -hmm. or whatever but at nearby entirely it could interact and produce it could inter yeah okay so I uh, the thing is they would most likely produce a shower the fraction of showers that we expect is really, really low. We don't have many showers in our data. That's one thing. So if we would really consider this, we would have to do a shower, not a track analysis. If we really consider the electron neutrinos that produce electrons. Okay. Well, why is that? Hmm? Why do you have uh, as, much, as many showers as uh, trucks? Uh, the showers are much smaller. So it's harder for us to detect them. So this you is miss them? Yeah, we oftentimes miss them. We just have maybe one hit. Oh, so it hits and one Antares is at the moment the, the, the most compact one. Uh, why do I have this slide? Ah, uh, there. You have 60, 70, I, I don't know, it's smaller than that. Within. Within a line, no, this is the. Uh, this is a within, a within one line, the separation oh. of this. Oh. This is the main reason why we don't see that many. And the other thing is that there are certain un, uh, asymmetries in between electron and more neutrinos. Uh, not, not the big ones, but mainly it is the detector layout. We have difficulties seeing these showers. There are attempts to, or there were attempts to look for these rare showers and probably be able to see the double bang that a tau one would produce, but there's absolutely no hope to see this, at least not with with this. Um, Came3Net has a sub-project called Orca, which will be a more dense region. There we might actually see more showers. Yeah, probably even within, in, 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 you know, the QNet, the, I mean the, the, the separation, the mean separation would be smaller. Uh, like Came three net. Yeah, typical uh, like um, separation in ice cube, and in that case, uh, the showers are uh, more promising than uh, mm -hmm. cracks, basically because the, the background is uh, yeah. 20, 30 times smaller. Yeah. Even if, w as long as you have uh, uh, reasonable, I mean, yeah. bad, that you you have bad, but, uh, but the, uh, angular resolution, but if you have 30 yeah. degrees, that would be enough for the showers to be yeah. the, the tracks, yeah, because the background is uh, much smaller. Yeah. For but, but you yeah. have to see them. I, I, we can see them. Ice Cube has shower analysis. I don't know. For, uh, for Ice Cube, for example, yeah. showers are better than the yeah. tracks. Yeah, we know that most of the diffuse flux that they all have discovered was shower. Although they present limits with tracks only. Yeah. So I don't understand why. I don't understand them all, all the time either. But. Uh <laughs> um, no, in, in, in Game 3 Net, this will be different. But. Yeah. Um, we have shower analysis, but we see very few of them. Okay. Anything else? No questions. If not, we thank Christoph. Okay.